Welcome back to the AI Daily Brief. Today, we are first talking about this massive OpenAI AMD deal and why it might be an even bigger deal than the things that were announced at Dev Day. And then we are following up with the benefit of a day of reactions and responses to see how the announcements from Dev Day are settling into the community. So even before the lights went up at Fort Mason and OpenAI announced Agent Builder and apps and all the things that it announced, they were making news with a massive new deal with AMD. The deal will theoretically see OpenAI deploy six gigawatts worth of AMD AI chips over multiple years. And boy, are there a lot of takes going around with this. First of all, there are the implications for AMD itself. AMD relative to NVIDIA is one business battle where the number two is not even in the same league as number one, at least when it comes to market response. This is, in fact, the biggest deal that AMD has signed, as CEO Lisa Su put it. She wrote, this is certainly the largest deployment we've announced so far. Now we're embarking on a massive build-out. It's a big deal for us, for our shareholders, and for our teams. Now, the deal is not traditional. As part of the deal, OpenAI acquired the option to purchase 160 million AMD shares at a penny apiece, which represents around 10% of the company. AMD shares have not traded below $50 in the past five years, so this represents a 99.9% .9 discount under any foreseeable market conditions. The options are tied to OpenAI's purchase and deployment of AMD chips, as well as AMD's stock price increasing. Sue said that she wanted to ensure that, quote, OpenAI would be motivated for AMD to be successful. And the more OpenAI deploys, the more revenue we get, and they get to share on the upside. On OpenAI's side, the deal is all about securing as many chips as they can from any source available. Sam Altman said, it's hard to overstate how difficult it's become to get enough compute. We want it super fast, but it takes some time. Now, given NVIDIA and OpenAI's recent deal, some people were surprised to see OpenAI jump in bed with NVIDIA's competitor, AMD. Bubble Baby Boy on Twitter went viral with a tweet that said, Sam has crossed the one person you don't cross. He only exists because Jensen says so. It's going to get ugly here. Allman clearly thinks that this is not the moment for that sort of competition, and we are very much in a all boats rise kind of phase. Said Altman in the Wall Street Journal, we're in a phase of the build-out where the entire industry's got to come together and everybody's going to do super well. You'll see this on chips, you'll see this on data centers, you'll see this lower down the supply chain. Of course, for those looking for signs of a bubble, this absolutely reignited that conversation. Tashi Michel from TAM Capital Management said, This deal feels like a jump the shark moment. The deal structure is just so stupidly unbelievable. Matt Levine had a much retweeted take. In his newsletter, he wrote, How do those negotiations go, like schematically? OpenAI says, we would like six gigawatts worth of your chips to do inference. AMD says, terrific, that'll be 78 billion. How would you like to pay? OpenAI says, well, we were thinking that we would announce your deal and that would add 78 billion to the value of your company, which should cover it. AMD, no, pretty sure you have to pay for the chips. OpenAI says, why? AMD says, I don't know, just seems wrong not to. OpenAI says, okay, why don't we pay you cash for the value of the chips and you give us back stock and when we announce the deal, the stock will go up and we'll get our 78 billion back. AMD says, yeah, I guess that works, though I feel like we should get some of the value. OpenAI says, okay, you can have half. You give us stock worth like $35 billion and you keep the rest. You also saw some folks like Paul Tudor Jones weigh in with their renewed bubble calls. As reported by Walter Bloomberg, Paul Tudor Jones told CNBC that stocks could surge sharply before a blow-off top, once again comparing today's setup to the 1999 tech bubble. Now, PTJ was talking about far more than just the sort of OpenAI deals. He was also looking at broader macro conditions as well. Overall, unfortunately, we are due for another bubble show as this conversation has surged once again. There are also plenty of people out there still pointing out what makes this cycle different, most notably the fact that so far at least this CapEx boom is not funded by debt. In other words, the hyperscalers who are making these CapEx bets are not leveraged. There's also another interesting dimension to explore, which Doug Laughlin from Semi Analysis put this way, the real issue, he said, is how much liquidity the private credit market can handle. They're sitting on an ungodly amount of capital and they have to deploy it. Still, when it came to the immediate term reactions, for traders on Wall Street, this was a moment to get enthusiastic or get out of the way. AMD stock ripped by 24% following the deal announcement, getting close to their all-time high from last March. And by the way, it was not just AMD. Companies that were mentioned on stage during Dev Day also saw a big pop. HubSpot was up as much as 10%. Figma was up 15%. Even HumbleBookings.com and Coursera were up 2% and 4% respectively. Like I said, we are going to have to come back to this bubble conversation later in the week, but for now, let's turn back to Dev Day and see how narratives are settling now a full day after the announcements. So to briefly recap everything that was shipped at Dev Day, 
The two big announcements were apps in ChatGPT that you could now interact with things like Canva and Bookings.com and Coursera and Expedia and eventually a whole slew of other things directly from within that ChatGPT window. And of course, the other big announcement was AgentKit, a new tool for building agents. That's the one that we had started to hear about about 24 hours before Dev Day. We also got a bunch of updates around the API. Sora 2 and Sora 2 Pro are now in the API, as is GPT-5 Pro. Plus, there were a bunch of updates for Codex, including Codex and Slack. And separate from DevDay, they also announced a cheaper image model and a cheaper real-time voice model. Now, I did my highly scientific gut check of what people thought was the most exciting announcement at DevDay, and it was pretty split between apps and agent builder, with Sora 2 and GPT-5 Pro in the API making a nice little showing as well. But as the messages have settled in, I think that there are a few big conversations that stand out. The first is that, at least in my little corner of the world, people are more bullish than I might have even thought about the apps feature. I had wondered if folks were going to think it was just GPT's 2.0, which was one of the main things I talked about in yesterday's Rapid Reaction episode. But instead, it definitely seems like people have a sense that there could be a major interface inflection here. Investor Hemant Pohaptra writes, ChatGPT is the next browser. Swix pointed out that it's even better on mobile, saying, does this look like a browser? It's not. It's the ChatGPT app being your browser. VC Anisha Charya writes, an open question was answered today. What will the AI native distribution channel be? It looks like ChatGPT will be that channel with 800 million active users and the app's SDK. This is likely as important as Steve Jobs announcing the App Store in March of 2008. Now, we've heard that analogy before, but the fact that it's coming back up is telling in and of itself. And just like with the App Store, one of the other points of conversation is the interesting trade-off that companies now face. Keep control of your experience with your own app or focus on accessing those 800 million potential customers by building in someone else's experience. Another analogy that was being thrown around a lot was ChatGPT as the non-Chinese everything app. Signal writes ChatGPT is turning into WeChat. And more than a few folks made the joke that at this point, ChatGPT looks more like the everything app than X does despite Elon Musk's explicit intention to turn X into the everything app. Aaron Levy from Box, who was one of their launch partners, points out still how early we are in figuring out what the next generation of interfaces actually look like. He wrote, OpenAI's apps and ChatGPT are a great example of how early we've been with agentic design patterns. This update is like going from DOS to the early stages of Windows or Mac. We've been living in a text-only interaction paradigm for nearly three years with AI, yet if history tells us anything, we know that the tools are going to have to get far more interactive. He basically says that while there is a lot of stuff that's great about text, for example how fast it is, it's not necessarily the best interface for monitoring what an agent is doing. He concludes, ChatGPT's apps are a great first entry into what disparate interactive GUIs could look like when showing up in a common interface. They nailed a bunch of the right early interaction challenges in this first rev. One thing that will become tricky, of course, he writes, is how the industry coalesces on some form of standardization for these interaction patterns. We're most likely in for a set of OS wars like we've seen on desktop and mobile, now with potentially even higher stakes. And this idea of ChatGPT as expanding its footprint is not just coming from outside, it's also coming from within. During a Q&A with reporters, head of ChatGPT Nick Turley said, what you're going to see for the next six months is an evolution of ChatGPT from an app that is really, really useful into something that feels a bit more like an operating system. Within ChatGPT, he said, people will be able to access services and software, both existing software that they're used to using and new software built natively atop ChatGPT. All right, so that's where a lot of the talk about apps is, but what about Agent Builder? In that case, the initial bullish response seeded a little bit to a bunch of critiques around the UI. This screenshot of just a very confusing control panel has been flying around on X a lot. And one of the people who shared it was Gosu Coder, who wrote, I had some time to think about OpenAI's agent kit. I think my thoughts can be summed up as, somehow we ended up circling back to no code, which didn't really work out before. But the quick deploy of these agent workflows will result in a ton of use, so I could see this getting a lot of use. Seeing this image floating around, which looks pretty rough, but I'm sure they will improve it. I like this take because it embodies the, uh, well, I'm not sure, but maybe kind of thinking that I think a lot of people have around this. Froquan Ridan was more critical of that UI, saying, OpenAI's agent kit launch shows the industry is still thinking in old paradigms. Visual builders and drag and drop canvases feel like we're creating no-code tools from a decade ago. The real breakthrough will be a conversational agent that lets you describe what you want in natural language and it builds itself. No canvas, no notes, no workflows. I'm Jab Asad from Replit Agrees, saying AI was supposed to save us from UIs like this which is why we bet on a pure natural language interface for Replit's agent builder. Visualization is there for debugging and understanding, not building. Still, Gurgalia Rose writes, 
I really don't think most people appreciate the difference between shipping something in six weeks, beating the global competition, i.e. first to offer an agent workflow builder, then fixing up small issues in six more weeks, versus building for six months and no one cares by launch. I think there are a couple things going on here. The first of all, broadly speaking, I totally agree that the broad paradigm that for mass usage, we're going to have to shift to a different type of UI paradigm than this sort of drag and drop workflow builder thing that we've had for a long, long time now. I think that style of interface is extremely intimidating. It's got a high barrier to entry, but also that makes me think that this product isn't designed for the average user. This doesn't feel like in this state, it is meant to be a consumer facing tool. It's instead supposed to have more fine grained control for developers who are building with this. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but that's my interpretation. So I think between that and Gergely's point, that speed and velocity are basically the only thing that matters. I think it starts to make a bit more sense. Now, when it came to the Q&A with Sam Altman and Greg Brockman that happened after the keynote, there wasn't all that much that was novel and worth sharing, except for the fact that they do seem to be thinking a lot more about enterprise and B2B issues than I might have thought. Brockman said that boring enterprise problems are still massively underserved by AI startups right now, and of course, Building an enterprise AI startup, I totally agree. Sam Altman also mentioned that they feel like their forward deployed engineers are getting closer to having a templated kind of understanding around how to implement AI inside enterprises. So I will definitely be watching to see if anything interesting comes from that. A lot of the chatter following the event was all about just how powerful Codex is, embodied, if nothing else, in how much it's being used internally to open AI to ship at this crazy velocity that they're currently shipping at. Some of the stats that they shared were that 92% of the technical staff are now using Codex daily. 70% more PRs are submitted per week by engineers that use Codex as opposed to those who don't. And 100% of PRs are now reviewed by Codex. OpenAI's Stephen Heidel wrote, It's difficult to overstate how important Codex has been to our team's ability to ship new products. For example, the drag and drop agent builder we launched today was built end to end in under six weeks, thanks to Codex writing 80% of the PRs. Hater at Slow Developer points out that this matches the AI 2027 Reports 2026 forecast for coding automation going mainstream, agents working like teammates, and AI R&D speeding up because of algorithms, not just compute. Allie Miller thinks that the implications are for way beyond OpenAI. She wrote, every team's coding workflow just changed. Code review at OpenAI reviews every PR when they come in. Codex SDK is software that builds more software, turns your app into a self-evolving app. She even thought that the Codex and Slack integration was maybe being undersold as a representation of just how teammate Codex is getting. She writes, using Codex and Slack lets you tag in Codex as a teammate to go off and take action. And I think this idea of software that can update itself vis-a-vis -vis Codex is something that we're going to see a lot more discussion of soon. GDP who does AI at Amazon wrote, Codex SDK has to be the most brilliant announcement of the OpenAI Developer Day. Now you can have apps that are updated in real time in response to user feedback and complaints. There are going to be a lot of strange effects to this, but it is mind-boggling that this is even possible. Finally, I also did want to give a shout out that while it wasn't the primary emphasis of the day, we did see yet again the cost-performance frontier continue to shift. OpenAI's Sherwin Wu tweets, Don't sleep on GPT Real-Time Mini, a 70% cheaper version of the full-size model. This should make many voice workflows cheap enough to deploy widely. But the real surprise, our internal qualitative testing has it scoring higher than even GPT real-time for voice quality. As we've discussed, I think increasingly, as we get to bigger deployments and larger, especially enterprise workloads, cost is going to matter in a way that hasn't in the past, and so the cost performance frontier continuing to be pushed out is ultimately actually significant. The last note today, as Dev Day came to a close on Monday, Sam Ullman brought Johnny Ive on stage for a fireside chat about the OpenAI devices. Ive revisited his core thesis for the range of devices, stating, when I said we have an uncomfortable relationship with our technology, I mean that's the most obscene understatement. We have a chance to not just redress that, but absolutely change the situation we find ourselves in. That we don't accept this has to be the norm. Earlier this week, we got reports that Ive's team was battling a string of technical issues that could delay release, with the FT claiming that they were having problems with personality, inference, and implementing an always-on approach, so basically everything involved in the device. While Ive didn't mention this directly, he did make it seem like the team was still exploring approaches and didn't have a firm roadmap that could even be delayed in this manner. He said that the progress is still moving rapidly, adding, That momentum has led us to create 15 to 20 really compelling product ideas. The challenge is to focus. It would be easy if you knew there are three good ones. It's just not like that. We're designing a family of products, and we're trying to make sure we're judicious and thoughtful in what we focus on and then to not be distracted. So alas, for those looking for hints, they are still very few and far between. In any case, that's the wrap-up. Big news in the markets. 
big chatter among developers. Gotta think it's a pretty successful day for OpenAI. For now, that is going to do it for today's AI Daily Brief. Appreciate you listening or watching as always. And until next time, peace.